Okay, let's talk about brand three. Um, brand three is the shortest chapter in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. It is only 1,699 words. Um, there is one aria chapter in A Storm of Swords that, that comes close, but this is, other than that, this is by far the shortest chapter. It is um, very brief, but we go back to it often because it's so important. Um, it is Bran's fever dream with the three-eyed crow. And it um it really begins the the theme of of who Bran is. Um Bran is a stand-in for the Arthurian legend of the Fisher King. Um the Fisher King is a man who is injured in the thigh or crotch area, who is the last of his line, who cannot have children. And so he is this wise king, and people have to find the Holy Grail for him to try to heal him. And so this idea of this crippled um, character who's searching for a supernatural way to heal himself is... is um, is Brand's story. Um, and uh, I mean, we'll get into it, into it a bit. There's some other big themes with Bran and, and that, that connect to things like Hinduism and Odin and things like that. But for the most part, um, we start with that legend of the, of the, of the Fisher King. And of course the, everything is get turned on its head, right? The Fisher King is healed by the Holy Grail but in Bran's story, we find out that he can never be, he can never be healed. And um, where do you go from there with a character who is truly sort of the end? The interesting thing about the Fisher King as well is the Fisher King, um, what happens to him happens to his kingdom. And so while he is crippled and they call him the Fisher King because he just spends his day fishing because he's injured. But because he's injured, the land and the people and the world is injured. And when he's healed, the world is healed. And so there's an interesting aspect to the fact that Bran can't be healed. But the question is, can the world be healed? Um, anyway, let's get into it. Bran. It seems it seemed as though he had been falling for years. Fly, a voice whispered in the darkness. But Bran did not know how to... Uh, to know how to fly. All he could do was fall. Maester Lewin made a little boy of clay, baked him till he was hard and brittle, dressed him in Bran's clothes, and flung him off a roof. Bran remembered the way he shattered, but I never fall, he said, falling. Um, the ground was so far below him that he could barely make it out through the gray mists that whirled around him. But he could feel how fast he was falling, and he knew what was waiting for him down there. Even in dreams, you could not fall forever. He would wake up in the instant before he hit the ground, he knew. He always woke up the instant you hit the ground. So um, this idea of falling forever being weightless, you know, th this, this has made me think that George R. R. Martin was thinking about sensory deprivation. Um, with regards to Bran, this was a... A, a fairly, uh, this was a, a staple of sci-fi in the late seventies, early eighties, um, especially the movie Altered Beasts, where you know, if, if through through sensory deprivation we could unlock our mind and discover new things or something, uh, or through I, and with psychotropic drugs as well. Um, and so I, I kind of got got this idea that well, he he being, you know, in darkness in a coma um falling later he's in the crypts and darkness again this idea that you know this separate sensory deprivation is 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 waking him up uh enhancing his mind the the falling again it's the, the to remove this um the physical feeling of gravity and what it does to you i mean you know all part of the sensory deprivation um But it also makes me wonder about, because there's so much focus on his falling, he says he never falls. And yes, he only falls because Jamie 
tosses him from the tower. But there is this sense of guilt or hurt with the idea that he fell. And so I do wonder if there's some other point in which Bran falls that, that gets referred to. Um, this is why I kind of think about the the pit, um, the sinkhole uh, in in A Dance with Dragons and whether or not that sinkhole is something that he would fall from. Um, the ground was closer now, still far away, a thousand miles away, but closer than it had been. It was cold here in the darkness. There was no sun, no stars, only the ground below coming up to smash him and the gray mists and the whispering voice. He wanted to cry. That's the other thing that makes me wonder about the sinkhole. Like what's, what's with the cold and the darkness? Um, we know that Bran's room is specifically not cold because uh, Cat was was making sure that it was not cold. Um, I mean, I'm sure at night it's dark, but and he's in a coma, it's dark. But there should not be any coldness. So I do wonder if about again about the sinkhole and whether the sinkhole has a coldness to it. He wanted to cry, not cry, fly. I can't fr- fly, Bran said. I can't. I can't. How do you know? Have you tried? The voice was high and thin. Bran looked around to see where it was coming from. A crow was spiraling down with him, just out of reach, following him as he fell. Help me, he said. I'm trying, the crow replied. Say, got any corn? Um, this is the first time we really hear about the, the ravens wanting corn. It's first brought up only two chapters later. John finally makes it to the wall and he meets Mormon's raven who asks for corn. So this is kind of the um, the first introduction of of. And, you know, he, these chapters are written so close to each other that, that clearly George was trying to make us connect Mormon's Raven with the Thread Crow uh, by having the, the corn reference. Bran reached into his pocket as the darkness. I mean, I guess uh, there's the corn that he brings when he goes up to the towers. But we can, <laughs> the fact that he writes the John 3 so close to this one, I mean, it's literally just two chapters later. But yeah, I guess he brings the corn when he goes when he goes uh, when he goes climbing. So now we're thinking about the the the, the crows, um, and the ravens. Well, actually, are they? Yeah, I think they're crows at the uh, at the at the tower. Um, I guess it's this idea that the that the that the three-eyed crow was looking through those those crows at the uh, at the tower as well, following him, which later I guess is confirmed and in A Dance with Dragons when Blood Raven says he was watching him when he fell. Bran reached into his pocket as the darkness spun dizzily around him. When he pulled his hand out, gold, golden kernels slid from beneath, between his fingers into the air. They fell with him. The crow landed on his hand and began to eat. Are you really a crow? Bran asked. Are you really falling? The crow asked back. It's just a dream. Is it? asked the crow. I'll wake up when I hit the ground, Bran told the bird. You'll die when you hit the ground, the crow said. It went back to eating corn. Um, and there is this real big question of, of why didn't Bran die? He fell from a tower. He should have died. Um, it was a pretty amazing feat that he didn't. And that instead he went into this coma. Um, I, I think fans theorize that the crows went underneath him and cush- cushioned his fall. Uh, in order to stop him, because um, he really should have, he really should have died. And here, here we get this confirmation: yes, you'll die when you hit the ground. So, which well, you know also makes me think about the sinkhole and if he was going to die when he hits the ground there, and why it's important that he needs to fly before he hits the ground. Bran looked down; he could see mountains now, their peaks white with snow and silver threads of rivers and dark woods. He closed his eyes and began to cry. So now he's flying above the world. That won't do any good, the crow said. I told you, the answer is flying, not crying. How hard can it be? I'm doing it. The crow took to the air and flapped around Bran's head. You have wings, Bran pointed out. Maybe you do too. Bran felt along his shoulders, groping for feathers. There are different kinds of wings, the crow said. So, I mean, <clears throat> clearly the 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 thread crow is saying that Bran has some sort of 
uh, telepathic abilities, and that's what he means by wings. In in this situation, there, there's no other linguistic thing for wings. And, you know, it's not like we're talking about political parties or the edges of a theater or anything like that. Um, but he's talking, he's saying that, you know, you have, you have telepathic abilities here by saying you have different type of wings. Bran was staring at his arms, his legs. He was so skinny. Just skin stretched taut over bones. And so here Bran is sensing that he's lost weight from being in the coma. Had he always been so thin? He tried to remember. A face swam up at him out of the gray mist, shining with light, golden. The things I do for love, it said. And clearly this is supposed to be Jamie. Um, again, Bran, when he was about to be thrown from the tower, he never thinks about Jamie's name. He, he talks about the queen and he talks about how the man is a, a mirror image of the queen, but he never says Jamie Lannister. And so that continues on in, in, his, in his memories. He never calls him Jamie Lannister. He just calls him things like the golden man. Um, so the golden man is, I mean, it's clearly it's Jamie. Um, but the, I guess there's this question, does the, is the golden man someone besides Jamie? Is he someone more than Jamie? Is he, is he beyond that? Is there some other meaning for the golden man? Bran screamed. The crow took the air, to the air, cawing. Not that, it shrieked, it, it shrieked at him. Forget that. You do not need it now. Put it aside. Put it away. It landed on Bran's shoulder and pecking at him. And the shining golden face was gone. Um... Yeah, I always thought this was kind of an interesting. It's not like he, he talked about that being a person. He said, forget that. You do not need it now. Put it aside. Put it away. Like, what, what does he mean? Like, what is the face? And why would he need the face? You know? Why would he need this golden face? Um, and what, what is, why is the thread crow saying, oh, you don't need it? It's very, very interesting, what, whatever this is. What is the golden face besides Jamie Lannister? You do not need it. And it's not, you do not need him. You don't, uh, forget about him. Forget that. You do not need it. You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know. The black gate, that's a face. You know, like, what is it? But it's white, not golden. The golden face was gone. Bran was falling faster than ever. The gray mists howled around him as he plunged towards the earth below. What are you doing to me? He asked the crow tearfully, teaching you how to fly. I can't fly. You're flying right now. I'm falling. Every flight begins with a fall, the crow said. Look down. I always thought this, this always reminded me of Hitchhiker's Guide where, you know, he says falling is just missing the earth, you know, and things like that. Flying is just falling while missing the earth. Um, look down. I'm afraid. Look down. Bran looked down and felt his insides turn to water. The ground was rushing up at him now. The whole world was spread out below him, a tapestry of white and brown and green. He could see everything so clearly that, for a moment, he forgot to be afraid. He could see the whole realm and everyone in it. He saw Winterfell as eagles see it. Tall towers looking squat and stubby from above. The castle walls just lines in the dirt. He saw Maester Lewin on his balcony, studying the sky through a polished bronze tube and frowning as he made notes in a book. There is some question on what, you know, did George already know about, you know, the comet coming or did the seasons and things like this? Like, what is, um, and now Lewin gets this, you know, bronze tube earlier. So this is kind of a new thing for him to get, to, to get this and make notes. Um, to to be studying astronomy and thinking about that kind of stuff. And why was it important, you know? He saw his brother Rob, taller and stronger than he remembered, practicing swordplay in the yard with real steel in his hand. That's kind of funny, right? Because it, it was Joffrey was making fun of him for not using real steel. And now he's using real steel, He's you know? Joffrey's mocking, I think, actually, like maybe 
maybe i mean i understand that in the cat in cattle three i think you know they say oh you've got a sword now it's time but but there's a bit of like there's a bit of metaphor of him switching from the wooden sword to the to the 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 metal sword the metal sword the real steel that he's you know now supposed to be a real man i mean clearly joffrey was was making that joke like oh let's be real men let's use real steel he saw Sodor, the simple giant from the stables, carrying an anvil to Micken's forge, hefting it onto his shoulder as easily as another man might heft a bale of hay. That's just how strong Hodor is that he can go around carrying an anvil. At the heart of the godswood, the, white tr- the great white wood brooded over its reflection in the black pool, its leaves rustling in a chill wind. When it felt Bran watching, it lifted its eyes from the still water and stared back at him knowingly. Um, there is some question because because later Bran gets gets um, dreams of werewoods and he gets dreams of crows. But there's a werewood here in this one. There's there's crows in the werewood dreams. There's werewoods in the crow dreams. There's there's some fan theories about whether the the tree represents Blood Raven and the Thread Crow might re- might represent something else, but it gets all very messy as as they all just kind of appear together. In truth, George, you know, didn't really know what the Thread Crow was at this time when he wrote this, so he's he's just kind of writing. He looked east and saw a galley racing across the water of the bite. He saw his mother sitting alone in a cabin, looking at a blood-stained knife on a table in front of her as the rowers pulled their oars and Sir Roderick leaned across across a rail, shaking and heaving. Uh, so clearly this is, you know, happening already. Um, so Catalan, I guess Catalan's, it must be many days after, after Catalan leaving because she's already on the boat. She's made it down to White Harbor. A storm was gathering ahead of them, a vast dark roaring lashing by lightning and somehow they could not see it the idea that they're heading into some sort of danger and the storm being more metaphorical he looked south and saw the great blue green rush of the trident he saw his father pleading with the king his face etched with grief he saw sansa crying herself to sleep at night and he saw Arya watching in silence and holding her secrets hard in her heart so you're already so he saw, sees the incident of the, of the, um, of the la- lady and Micah incident. There were shadows all around them. One shadow was dark with ash. With the, um, this is what's kind of funny here. One shadow was dark with ash, with the terrible face of the hound. Clearly, this is supposed to be Sandor Clegane. Another was armored like the sun, golden and beautiful. We're supposed to be thinking that this is that this is um, Jamie. Over them both loomed a giant in armor made of stone. But when he opened his when he opened his visor, there was nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood. So, I mean, we're moving on from from the uh the trident micah lady incident and the mary incident because because i mean jamie's not there he's still searching for for aria in the wilderness but even in that area even if we accept that the hound and jamie was there the mountain is not there but because clearly this last guy is supposed to be the mountain right a giant in armor made of stone but when he opened his visor there was nothing but darkness and thick black blood you know that's uh that's you know clearly the mountain and here we even get this idea of of this thick black blood and his future as as a zombie or whatever he lifted his eyes and saw clear across the narrow sea to the free cities in the green dothraki sea and beyond to vase dothrak under its mountain to the fabled lands of the jade sea to a shy by the shadow where dragons stirred beneath the sunrise Right? So we hear that the eggs are from a shy. And so there's this idea that the, that the eggs 
come from a shy and so it comes from where dragons might be and their magic um this has been retconned now we kind of now george has made the the eggs from Dreamfire and have a whole has a whole story on where they came from there um so i guess this has been this doesn't make uh as much sense as it used to unless it's some sort of a shy magic or something or a shy knowledge that helped that helped uh, hatch the eggs. But it's very clear that at this point, the dragons were supposed to be some sort of Eastern idea that they came from a shy, the dragon eggs from a shy. And here they are, are, are not that. But it might also be that these, you know, these dreams are based on the knowledge of, of the three-eyed crow. And if the three-eyed crow believes something, even if it's wrong, then, then, uh, he would put it in. Finally, he looked north. He saw the wall shining like blue crystal. And his bastard brother, John, uh, sleeping alone in a cold bed. His skin growing pale and hard as the memory of all warmth fled from him. We, So this um, John feeling cold in his bed is something that happens many times uh, throughout the series. He usually has a dream about the crypts. Um, and then some people say, oh, is his is him growing pale and hard like him dying? Well, then he's not alone in his bed, <laughs> you know, or maybe they'll tend to take him. Maybe they're, after his stabbing, they're going to put him in a bed. What? I don't know. But um, he feels he, th this happens a couple times where he's in the bed and he's feeling cold and he has the dreams about the crypts. But um, some people, you know, think this is referring to him him being dead at the end of A Dance with Dragons. And maybe it's all of it. Maybe it's all of those things. And he looked past the wall, past endless forests cloaked in snow, past the frozen shore, um, and the great blue-white rivers of ice, and the dead plains where nothing grew or lived. Um, and the north, and north and north he looked. This, um... George doesn't necessarily know the geography yet here, but you know, the frozen shore isn't really north, you know. But uh, you know, we'll forgive him at the time, you know. The great blue white rivers of ice and the dead plains where nothing grew or lived. North and north he looked to the curtain of light at the end of the world. And then beyond that cur curtain. So we don't really know what this curtain of light is. You know, um, in the fanfic, I'd, I'd put in that it was a curtain of ice in, in the sinkhole and things like that. But um, we don't know what this means. You know, like what is beyond this curtain at the end of the world? Uh, and what is the heart of winter? Um, he looked deep into the heart of winter. And then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. So we have this mystery box of the curtain and the heart of winter. And here's the big thing, he says. Now you know, the crow whispered, now, uh, as it sat on his shoulder, now you know why you must live. And he says, now, now you know, but Bran doesn't know anything. Why, Bran said, not understanding, falling, falling because winter is coming. Whatever Bran sees, he never thinks about it again. <laughs> and we don't know. We don't know the secret, the secret to everything on why Bran must live. Bran looked at the crow on the shoulder and the crow looked back. It had three eyes. We had this idea of three eyes. Um, Hindu, Hindu religion believes that your third eye, the third eye is one of wisdom and knowledge. Um, and in, in this situation, we, we, it's also much like Odin in the sense that Odin loses an eye to gain more wisdom through his other eye. If Bran is crippled and gains knowledge. So there's a, there's a sacrifice being made for, for greater knowledge is, is this idea. So, um, and the third eye was full of terrible knowledge. Bran looked down, um, 
we're going to be hearing more and more about this three eye with the raven pecking at his forehead and it opening when it's under when he's in the crypts and things like that there's nothing below him now but snow and cold and death a frozen wasteland where jagged blue white spires of ice um waited to embrace him um yeah we get this image of him flying over these white spires they flew up at him like spears and he saw the bones of a thousand other dreamers impaled on their points. He was desperately afraid. And so we don't really know what this means. Like, what is this plane of, of spires with dreamers? Who are the dreamers? Um, and the fanfic, I interpreted this as, as a thousand other brands from different timelines impaled on ice spires from falling in the sinkhole. Uh, but we, of course, like have no confirmation on what George actually means. But this is, you know, through most of this, people can kind of, you know, they're, they're, there's clearly we're clearly led to believe certain things. You know, this is the hound. This is Jamie. This is the mountain. Um, but fans have had a real tough time uh, figuring out what the curtain is, what the heart of winter is, what the jagged spires are, what the thousand dreamers are. This is where it gets very abstract. Um, can a man still be brave as he's, he's a, if he's afraid? He heard his own voice saying, small and far away. This, of course, is his father. Ned says this. His father's re replied to him, it's the only time a man can be brave. Um, and Bran himself revisits this when he's in the cave with the three-eyed crow. Now, Bran, the crow urged, choose, fly or die. Um, and we get this idea of, of, of choice. Choice is kind of this, uh, you know, important in, in existentialism that, that who gets to, who gets to, uh, who gets to choose their, their fate and their morality will you do and you're, you're, you're forming your moral, moral codes, not any sort of God. Um, and so this is, you know, there's a lot of focus on choice um, here. Death reached for him, screaming. Brand spread his arms and flew. Wings unseen drank the wind and filled and pulled him upward. Of course, this is if his wings are telepathic ability, right? <clears throat> And so his telepathic ability is the thing that's somehow making him fly or pulling him upward. The terrible needles of ice receded below him. So what's saving him from the what's saving him from the dying on the spires is his telepathic ability, or at least that's how I'm interpreting it. Um, you know, maybe his you know, as I say, his time travel or whatever saves him from. I interpret it as his time travel is saving him from, from dying on the spires, but who knows what George is actually thinking. Yeah, I'm sorry. This, this, this read through is a lot. I, you know, I've been through this chapter quite a bit and it's, you know, I kind of have puzzled through what is possible based on the story. And I, you know, I kind of have like creatively come up with what I think is possible, but it's like I say, it's, it's, very abstract and very open to interpretation. So the sky opened for opened above Bran's sword. It was better than climbing. It was better than anything. The world grew small beneath him. There's something very kind of metaphorical here with his power. I'm flying here, he cried out in delight. I've noticed, said Thread Crow. It took to the air, flapping its wings in his face, slowing him, blinding him. He faltered in the air as its pinions beat against his cheek. Its beak stabbed at him fiercely. And Bran felt a sudden blinding pain in the middle of his forehead. This is the, the pecking on his forehead that the, the Jojen later sees between his eyes. What are you doing? The crow opened its beak and caught at him. It's trying to create a third eye. A shrill scream of fear and the gray mists shuddered and swirled around him and ripped away like a veil. And he saw that the crow was really a woman, a serving woman with long black hair. And he knew her from somewhere, 
From Winterfell, yes, that was it. He remembered her now, and he realized that he was in Winterfell, in a bed high in some chilly tower room. And the black-haired woman dropped a basin of water to shatter on the floor and ran down the steps shouting, He's awake! He's awake! He's awake! I guess if his tower room is chilly, maybe maybe the whole thing is... Maybe the coldness applies. I don't know. Bran touched his forehead between his eyes. The place where the crow had pecked him was still burning. But there was nothing there. No blood, no wound. He felt weak and dizzy. He tried to get out of bed, but nothing happened. And then there was movement beside his, the bed. And something landed lightly on his legs. He felt nothing. A pair of yellow eyes looked into his own, shining like the sun. The window was open, and it was cold in the room. But the warmth that came off the wolf enfolded him like a hot bath. Um, his pup, Bran realized. Or was it? It was so big now. He reached out to pet him, his hands trembling like a leaf. When his when his brother Rob burst into the room, breathless from his dash up the tower steps, the direwolf was licking Bran's face. Bran looked up calmly. His name is Summer, he said. And so I suppose this is like this idea that, okay, he's go he's um he's the name Summer coming from this idea that okay, the um He's coming out of this horrible dream of winter, this horrible dream of pain, um, of of injury and all of this and death. And the idea is that, you know, maybe his name, maybe the direwolf's name should be Spring. But, uh, you know, the idea is that the direwolf and, and him coming out of this dream and being saved and and, and surviving is a, is a rebirth of, 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 of sorts. And um the dire wolf is going to help him into his telepathic journey and all of this. But so of course, like summer is this feeling of coming out of, of, uh, of winter and being reborn though. So maybe, maybe more appropriately, the, the dire wolf should have been named spring. You know, um, he has a dream of spring or whatever, but summer. So, um, yeah. So very, very short chapter, um, written very, very, Simply, if you look at how the sentences are all very, very short, um, I want to say, you know, you'll be hard pressed to find a a sentence that's more than what twelve words. And this is just George's style when he's writing Bran, um, that everything is going to be simple. But at the same time, you know, he it really shows. Um, George's ability that he's able to make something that is uh, that is very poetic feeling despite having some of the simplest language that you can have. I, I, I just threw the brand chapter into the Hemingway editor and which is a, a an app that grades like how complicated your your um your languages and it comes out as a grade three like a third grade reading level is what um is what the brand chapter comes out at which is pretty pretty impressive uh pretty impressive in how how simple uh george is able to make it with the words that he uses and everything um so there are a few sentences that are, you know, graded as, as hard to read, but not too many. Um, but anyway, that is Bran, one of the, uh, one of the most reread chapters. It's just, anyway. Um, all right. I guess we'll continue on. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.